behalf of the Student and Faculty Planning Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 1994 Institute on National Affairs. We will soon begin planning the 1995 Institute, and I would like first to invite any of you who may be interested to join with us in that process. If you would like to attend the upcoming committee meetings to begin selecting the topic and speakers, please contact the lectures program office for information regarding the time and place. Also, there are many, many upcoming events in addition to the other activities uh, of the Institute the remainder of this week. If you would stop by the table just outside the door and pick up uh, some of the literature, I'm sure you'll find other things that you won't want to miss. Our theme for this year's Institute is We the People redefining the American community. A lot of people have had a lot of difficulty trying to define the American community, although some people probably haven't had as much difficulty as they should have. A few years ago, for example, Robert Bella and some other sociologists wrote an influential book called Habits of the Heart in which they asserted that America had become a nation of individual believers and had lost its communal spirit. There were a few problems with this book. They forgot to interview Catholics and African Americans and Midwesterners generally. And so some of us ask, how did they define the American community? We should take note that this year's institute is dedicated to George Washington Carver, the first African American to be a student at ISU and the first to be a faculty member. We might speculate on how it was for him here. Did he experience community? And then we might ask, how is it 100 years later? How is it for African Americans at ISU? How is it for Latinos and American Indians? How is it for physically challenged faculty and for gay and lesbian staff and students? How are we experiencing community? How do we define community? These are the same questions being asked all across the country. So this is certainly an important topic and a very timely event. I know of no one more appropriate to help us think about the issue of community than our speaker tonight. You may have noticed that the brochure, on the, uh, the brochure for the Institute on National Affairs refers to, quote, the common good and to the, quote, greater good this is the language of philosophy, but in some traditions, it is also the language of theology. Cornel West is the rare person who speaks, sometimes preaches, in both languages, and who does so from the heart as well as from the head. For those of you who have come out on this cold night, I can assure you that you are in for a rare treat. To introduce Dr. West, it is my pleasure to present to you Ms. Candace Boyd, President of the ISU Black Student Alliance. Good evening. On behalf of the Black Student Alliance, I would like to welcome you tonight, and I will be introducing tonight's speaker, Cornell West. Cornell West is one of the best known African American academics in the United States. Graduating from Harvard University, magnum cum laude, in three years, Cornell went on to Princeton University where he received his master's degree and PhD. Today, he is once again at Princeton University as a professor of religion and director of the African American Studies Department. Cornell West has written a number of influential works, such as Breaking Bread, Insurgent Black Intellectual Life with Bell Hooks, Prophecy, Deliverance, An Afro-American Revolutionary in Christianity, Race Matters, and his latest work, Keeping Faith, The Philosophy of Race in America. Speaking tonight on the subject of race matters, I would like to introduce to you tonight Dr. Cornell West. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
so very much, though. Candace, thank you for that generous introduction. It is indeed my honor, my privilege, and blessing to be here in Iowa this chilly evening. <laughs> I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening, including President Martin Jiski, including my good friend Mary Sawyer, and including my new friends, Renee and Tiffany and Candace. And I'm sure I'll meet others before I leave at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning to be back in New Jersey in the classroom by 12. <laughs> I look forward to our conversation because we're going to save some good time for critical exchange and dialogue. It's so very important that we constitute the kind of public spaces in order to actually communicate with one another so that we, we can more effectively confront very deep problems of this nation and this world. The Institute of National Affairs, I view as a very important institution in terms of facilitating precisely the kind of public conversation that I promote. I stand before you tonight less as an individual with a set of achievements and accomplishments and much more as a very small part of a rich and grand tradition. It's a tradition of black freedom struggle. Long ago, I decided I wanted to give my time, my energy, and if need be, as you can imagine, my life to struggle for freedom, to keep alive a particular tradition that keeps track of the humanity of a people whose humanity has often been rendered invisible. And when one thinks of the Sojourner of Truth or Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and A. Philip Randolph, or Martin King, or my Uncle Max, or Fannie Lou Hamer, or Nella Baker, dwarfed by the level of courage and sacrifice, and love and care and service, not just isolated icons, but imperfect human beings who invested themselves in such a way, tried to keep alive a tradition, struggle for freedom. But it's not just black brothers and sisters, but it's brothers and sisters of all colors who have been part of the black freedom struggle. We need to know much more about Old sister Lydia Maria Child had published in 1829 that text, Appeal in Favor of That Class of Americans Called Africans. White sister. Part and parcel of the struggle against white supremacy in this country. When Elijah Lovejoy shot standing on his roof in Alton, Illinois. Alton, Illinois is not too far from here, is it? In 1837 struggling for black freedom. Need I mention John Brown? My neighbor, in fact, Russell Banks, is writing a great novel on John Brown. We need to come to terms with John Brown. I know so many people think he was crazy, he was confused, maybe so, but he had his eye on a prize, namely he was going to keep track of the humanity of people of African descent and a civilization that had trouble doing so. And he gave his life as well as his two sons at Harper's Ferry in 1859, October. Or Miles Hort of Highlander Center, who helped train and learn from Rosa Parks and Diane Nash and Stokely Carmichael and Robert Moses, and Martin King and a whole host of freedom fighters. Some fellow citizens would call Brother Miles Hort and white trash. No, 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 no. It was a white brother deeply committed to the struggle for black freedom. Or well, Jose Martí, one of the great freedom fighters of the modern times, and his critiques of white supremacy. Brown, brother. Or oh, Cesar Chavez, one Asian sister-like 
Grace Ball struggling this very moment in Detroit as she grieves the death of James Ball, friend to so many of us. A Jewish brother like the late Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a Jewish sister like Beatrice Magdal. The black freedom movement has always been a whosoever will movement. Those who are willing to hold up a bloodstained banner for struggle. For me, the black freedom movement is a species, is a version of what I call the radical democratic tradition. And the radical democratic tradition simply believes fundamentally that ordinary people ought to live lives of decency and dignity. There's a brother who used to play organ in my church, Shiloh Baptist Church. We knew him as Sylvester, but he's known to the world for the genius that he is. His name is Sly Stone. He wrote a song called Everyday People. The rest of the development picked it up, called it People Every Day. They talk a little bit faster, the younger generation. <laughs> Same point, same point. Everyday people have possibilities and potential. There are Promethean energies among everyday people if unleashed produce possibilities heretofore ignored, downplayed, and overlooked. But to put it more clearly, that there is a sense of the sublime, of grandeur, the tragic and problematic shot through the lives of everyday people. See, the Greeks didn't believe that. That's why they, they reserved the comic and the idyllic for the lives of everyday people. The tragic was reserved for who? The elites. Egyptians didn't believe it. How rare it was that the lives of everyday people could be taken seriously inside of the pyramids, even though everyday people built the darn things. Even Elizabethan England with the great Shakespeare reserved the tragic for elites. You got to turn to the Hebrew Bible, you got to turn to scripture to find an example of everyday people's lives having epic significant little David and off the wall Jonah. <laughs> and problematic Abraham and on and on and on let alone that New Testament that homeless Palestinian Jew who dies on a cross every day associating with the everyday and keep in mind that for so much of human history Intellectuals have characterized ordinary people across race, across gender, across sexual orientation, as mob and herd and rabble, as poisonous flies and raindrops and weeds and bacteria. Basic description of everyday people. That's why they have to be controlled, coerced to defer to kings and queens and prelates and potentates and monarchs. And of course, most of human history is what? Ordinary people having to defer to unaccountable elites. That's why democracies are so rare in human history. That's why they are short-lived. They usually don't last that long. And that's why to talk about race in the American experiment called American democracy. Is there no way to talk about an issue that's ghettoized and marginalized on the edges, on the periphery, not at all? Why? Because when we look at those infrequent experiments in democracy, against the backdrop of the history of the human adventure going back to the Sumerians of Mesopotamia or the Egyptians of Northern Africa, the conditions under which most democracies are undermined and begin to unravel. Increasing poverty that produces escalating levels of despair and increasing paranoia that 
generates escalating levels of distrust. No democracy can survive in the midst of a poverty and a paranoia, a despair and a distrust that shatters the body politic and people feel as if they no longer have links and bonds with one another. When public life more and more is viewed as empty and barren and vacuous, and we turn inward, our own selves, our own group, our own enclaves, our own slice of the various tribes that constitute humankind. Or to put it another way, to talk about white supremacy and its legacy is to acknowledge the degree to which issue of race was like a reptile wrapped around the legs of the table upon which the Declaration of Independence was signed by the Founding Fathers, and it has been haunting the American experiment ever since. Because to talk about race is talk about poverty, too many poor people, too many poor people of color. To talk about race is talk about paranoia. We distrust one another because of something as arbitrary and capricious as skin pigmentation and hair textures and nose sizes and lips and hips. <laughs> Can't talk about race without talking about white supremacist attacks on black beauty. Can't talk about race without talking about white supremacist attacks on black intelligence. Can't talk about race without talking about white supremacist attacks on black capacity and capability of black humanity per se. What then is one to do? Well, first and foremost, we have to do something that is quite un-American. We have to have a sense of history. It's difficult. Very, very difficult. People get uncomfortable when they have to look in the face 244 years of inheritable and chattel slavery of people of African descent. They don't want to talk about the degree to which slavery is over, but so many of its effects and consequences are still operative in terms of the psyche of each and every one of us, as well as the social space in which we live, and well as the perceptions and perspectives of each other. Because the moment the first proud, dignified, skilled African got off of the slave ship and set foot in the USA, very clear, the problematic of what Ralph Ellison called invisibility, black invisibility. Or Du Bois said it so well in the first chapter of First paragraph of the first chapter in his classic, The Souls of Black Folk of 1903. He says, between me and the other world, there was always an unasked question. And that question is, how does it feel to be a problem? The second paragraph goes on to say, being a problem is a strange experience. experience especially given the fact that one never recalls not being a prophet. What is he getting at? The sense of black people in the United States being viewed as a problem people rather than people with some problem. Crucial distinction. Each and every one of us have problems. That if we were to get to the bare facts of who and what we are, we featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces, that's us. That's us. Each of us have to find some meaning and value in order to face inescapable and unavoidable extinction of some sort. No escape from death. No escape from despair and dread and disease and disappointment. That's us. We all have problems. But a problem people is something else. A 
problem people means that these people constitute one homogeneous blob, one monolithic conglomerate, which makes each individual interchangeable and substitutable. I don't need one person to speak because all black people think the same way anyway. <laughs> I used to get this in class, even at Harvard College, and I'm the only black student sitting up in class when the issues of race come up. Yeah, I said, what do black people think about that, Cornell? Tell me about that. <laughs> you speak on behalf of 30 million. Because <laughs> you all have the same mind, same sensibility, you walk the same, you dance the same, you have the same orientation. That's invisibility, losing sight of individuality, diversity, multiplicity, humanity. And when black folk are perceived outside of the blob, vis-a-vis -vis the mainstream, it's as exotic object or transgressive object. Exotic object, I want to get close to you to be revitalized. Hmm, you got that rhythm. <laughs> Give me a little bit of it. Feeding a little dead and dull, I want to get close to you to feel vital and vibrant. Exotic object. Going all the way back to the history, of course, of minstrel. The minstrels are the first mass leisure time activity in America. White people, of course, putting on black face and acting as if they're black, but white black people cannot even see the show. And we can go from minstrels on up to popular culture. And the two pillars of popular culture, of course, are music and athletics. And I won't go into the Afro-Americanization of American music and athletics. We will go into it. We have questions and answers. We have a good time. But I mean, this is a sophisticated audience. I know that. But it's not just an exotic object. The sexualization of black bodies, the ascription of sexual prowess to black bodies, but also transgressive object, source of fear automatically. Presence of black bodies in mainstream spaces, disease. Not disease, but dis slash ease. Unease. Even among very well intended white brothers and sisters, you know? Black person walking to a cocktail party, you always wonder, well, should I go up to them and say something to them? Don't want them to feel out of place. How can we relate to them in such a way that they feel comfortable? It makes black people feel even more uncomfortable sometimes. But we get the point. Trying to be compassionate, we understand. Part of the history is here comes one of those problem people. How are we going to react? You go say hello, Bob. I'll come after you. Ask him about Michael Jordan. I'm being facetious, but you get the point. How difficult it is to constitute space with this genuine human interaction given a history in which black people have been viewed as problem people as a whole, not just another individual coming in. Well, it's hard to be just another human being coming in. All of this history behind, you see, this is part of the legacy. Because those 244 years of chattel slavery, black people had no legal status, no social standing, no public worth at all, or only of economic value, subject to the brutish contingency of the slave auction, which one's loved ones, one's mother, one's father, one's grandmother, one's child could be sold at will and violently punished at whim. In the land of opportunity and liberty, the grand city on the hill, the marble temple shining on the hill. Remember Malcolm X's scientific definition of a nigger, a victim of American democracy. It sounds oxymoronic, it sounds self-contradictory. But keep in mind, for the first 87 years of the founding of this particular grand, yet flawed, precious, yet precarious experiment called America, people of Africa said were enslaved right alongside, which raises deep questions. Is it the case that American democracy stability was in some sense predicated on black subordination? That's a chilling question. Why? Because there would not be a substantive attempt 
to engage in a genuine multiracial democracy until Reconstruction for 11 years, and it's so very important to keep in mind there were more black senators in the 1870s than there are now in 1994. And after 1965, America again had to raise the question, can we actually create a genuine multiracial democracy? Not a racially specific democracy in which black people were the floor which is to say it had to hit head on the ideology of white supremacy that institutionalized practices of positively charged whiteness and negatively debased blackness. Let me say that even more slowly and clearly. The degree to which European Americans had to be taught and told that they were white. And it didn't make any sense unless one looked at black folk. I'll give you an example. You take a Sicilian peasant from the southern part of Italy, whose major foes are usually northern Italians who've been exploiting the southern Italians for hundreds of years. They arrive at Ellis Island, and they're told they're white. And they say, what does that mean? What do you mean? I'm white. I'm from this village. And there's some people who you think are white that I don't like, Northern Italians. They say, no, you are now white because, see this over here? See these black folk right here? We got a racial caste system in place. We have a system of white skin privilege. Now, you're Catholic, so you're still going to be behind. <laughs> it's a Protestant nation. But these discriminatory laws against you Catholic white persons will not have the same weight and gravity as these racial caste systems against these people of African descent. Or imagine an Irish brother or sister struggling against the history of 500 years of British colonialism and imperialism is told you have now more in common with the white Brits than you do these black folk. Because of an ideology of whiteness begins to homogenize the multiculturalism among your, your American brothers and sisters. That's why we just debate on multiculturalism these days. It's always fascinating, you know? The governor of New York's mother speaks and dreams in Italian. They don't have her in mind when they talk about multiculturalism. They have me in mind. Because multiculturalism among Euro Americans is quite clean. Italians, Welsh, Brits. Eastern Europeans, if that's not multicultural, I don't know what it is. But no, that's not what we're talking about. What we're really talking about. Black, brown, women, gays, lesbians, and so forth. Well, let's just call it for that. The legacies of white supremacy, the legacies of male supremacy, the legacies of homophobia. That's what we're talking about. Oh, I see. It's not just multiculturalism we're talking about. Because whiteness has already cleaned the slate for the Euro-American brothers and sisters. Let's be clear. The history, crucial. 1877, when Rutherford B. Hayes withdraws the troops from the South, the white supremacist powers again shape the history and destiny of those in that South. And for the next 50 years, every two and a half days, some black child, black woman, or black man will be hanging from some tree. Strange fruit the southern trees bear that Billy Holiday sang about. Yes, that is part of the tragic history with which one must come to terms if one recognizes that fundamental challenge, a democratic experiment, is to deal with poverty and paranoia, the despair and the distrust. Where are things today in terms of this challenge? Beginning in the 50s and the early 60s, enlightened part of the decolonization of the third world, the impact of the anti-colonial struggles of India in 47 and China in 49 and Ghana in 57 and 18 African countries in 1960, the world itself began to be reshaped 
by the collective insurgency, the organizing and mobilizing of ordinary people around the world. I know some people just call it the third world. We're just talking about where the majority of humankind on the globe live and die. Right? Where most ordinary people live and die, third world. I think you call it the first, but I mean, we, it's interesting. It comes sequentially behind. But I want to suggest to you that one reason why it's so very important to engage in a candid and critical conversation about race is precisely because it takes us to the very heart and core of the crisis of American democracy. Because I'm fundamentally committed to radical democratic tradition, we want to ensure that ordinary people's voices are heard at the highest levels of the decision making processes in those institutions that guide and regulate their lives. Because I want to build on the history of the organizing of ordinary people that fundamentally believes in the conditions of democracy, freedom of association and movement and expression, separation of powers, how crucial judiciary, executive, and legislative so that elites can be rendered accountable at least across branches, so that there are in fact some means by which people's voices can be heard and not hemorrhaged and blocked. And my assumption is, of course, that ordinary people would not choose to be poor if they had a choice in the matter. I've got some friends who are monks and uh, take vows of poverty, but I don't think it's going to become a mass movement soon. <laughs> So my hunch is that ordinary people would choose to have food, shelter, decent education, decent housing, decent jobs. And if they don't, then their voices must not be heard in decision-making process that affect their lives. For those who are fundamentally committed to this ideal, then the present moment strikes me as rather, rather frightening and terrifying. Because there's an unprecedented lethal leakage, unprecedented lethal linkage, let me be clear. Relative economic decline, undeniable cultural decay, and a sense of political pessimism. Relative economic decline has to do, of course, with the downward mobility, experience of social slippage, people losing jobs as a result of the downsizing of the American middle class, the shift from a social structure that once looked like a diamond, a mass middle class, to an hourglass. And downward mobility brings out the worst in each and every one of us. It leaves us open to scapegoating. And scapegoating usually takes the form of blaming the most vulnerable members of the community for the impact negative impact of one's life. I was in Cairo, Illinois just the other day. I was trying to convince some deeply conservative white brothers that the reason why the factory shut down and they lost their jobs was not because black people owned it. <laughs> and yet they were convinced that it was just the presence of black bodies in town that accounted for their downward mobility. Scapegoating. Staying in contact with their pain and their anguish, but also trying to understand why it's articulated in such a reactionary way. Not turning toward elites, the most powerful, who made choices, decisions that affected their lives, but toward the most vulnerable members. Deep crisis in the culture. And some brothers say, well, it's must be because the women left the kitchen. If they had just stayed in the kitchen, the culture would be intact. As if women actually are running the culture industry and shaping the values and sensibilities of our day. Or oh, if just the gay brothers and lesbian sisters that stayed in the closet, we'd have our morality intact. Blaming again the most vulnerable members of the community. Why? Because downward mobility is a very difficult experience to come to terms with. And then at the same time, you've got redistribution of wealth going upward. Okay. The last 15 years, salaries of executive corporate executives has gone up 225% at a time in which they lay off workers, close plants, 
and slash benefits. Now, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in demonizing any group of the citizenry, but I do believe in telling the truth. It's called greed. Greed when that happens. There's no mechanism of accountability in place. And each one of us is subject to greedy proclivities. That's why democracy is necessary. Some means by which each one of us can be accountable. But it's not just the relative economic decline that one wants to know, but the way in which it is linked to, to the cultural decay. And of course, this is what people are talking about these days, and that's much to do with with, with, with race, what about by culture decay? What I mean is what it means to live in a market culture. A culture that evolves around buying and selling and promoting and advertising. And what it means to struggle with a market morality in which more and more people believe that they want to gain access to power and pleasure and property by any means what it means to struggle with the market mentality in which one's conception of the good life more and more is a matter of hedonism and narcissism and egoism. Culture of consumption that promotes an addiction to stimulation. Feeling down and out, go to the mall. Consume, feel good about yourself. Feel vital and vibrant. Or turn on the television and engage in that spectatorial passivity as those moving images and sound bombard you. Many of those images, degraded images of women, of course, as the commercials become more frequent to convince us to consume, 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 consume. The ultimate logic, of course, such a life, such a hedonistic life, is just hook up to a pleasure machine forever. No more conversation, friendship, just hook up to a pleasure machine, be stimulated. Well, since so much of the culture revolves around sexual foreplay and orgiastic intensity, just hook up to an orgasm machine. <laughs> just be stimulated at the highest level. So much of the culture is just on the way anyway. How spiritually impoverished a way of being in the world. And yet each and every one of us are deeply affected by this market culture. And the ultimate logic of a market culture in which non-market values are pushed to the edges, like love and care and concern and service to others, or like community, a justice, let alone in intimate relationships like tenderness and gentleness and kindness and sweetness. The ultimate logic is a gangsterization of American culture and society. And by gangsterization, I'm not just talking about streets and chocolate cities. I'm talking about high places as well. Levels of corruption and graft and lawlessness shot through corporate America, banks, middle America, poor America, across the board. And that gangsterization of a culture, gangsterization of a society results in what we saw in Los Angeles a few months ago, one year after the uprising. But you have a city with hardly a public life, with a major public problem, and it responds to thoroughgoing privatistic one. I get my gun, you get yours. I'll protect mine, you protect yours. Dodge City, a Hobbs and Wolf all against all. It's dangerous. Even more so, the way in which market culture has resulted in more and more of what sociologists historically view as benchmark of decline of every civilization known to humankind, which is the erosion of the nurturing system for children. It's not just family crisis, because of course, I'm sure some of the older Relatively older persons will tell you who still have their nuclear family intact that even when nuclear family was much more hegemonic in this society, it took more than two persons to raise a child. 
to closely knit neighborhoods. It took aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers and little league coaches and dance teachers. So it's not just a matter of the family. The family's in deep crisis, yes. But it's the larger nurturing system for children across the board, the, the requisite effective bonds and supportive networks and em empathetic linkages that are crucial to transmit to a younger generation meaning and value and direction and orientation and quest for excellence and elegance. And once those institutions are more and more shattered, then young people find themselves drifting, rootless, caught up in the dominant forces in the society, which are the market forces. In the culture industry, profit-driven culture industry, profit-driven entertainment industry with all of its sex and violence, provide the basic clues as to what it is to be human for young people. Now, there are a whole host of heroic young people who are quite critical of the market culture, no doubt. I don't want to engage in any kind of cheap, monolithic characterization of young people. In fact, some of the young people these days are hungry and thirsty to get beyond the pleasure machine. They want more than that. They know that life is short. But it's very difficult for young people to gain that cultural armor that each and every human being needs in order to deal with the ultimate facts of human existence, of death and dread, disease that I've talked about before. If you don't have that army, you usually fall back on aggressive instincts. Why? Because you distrust people, because you feel paranoia. See? And this is true within the de facto segregated residential patterns of this society. You've seen Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton's new book on housing segregation, where they showed that housing more segregated now than it was in the 1960s. Echoing George Clinton's talk about vanilla suburbs and chocolate cities, which makes it much more difficult for there to even be genuine spaces where people of various colors can come together. And the paradox, of course, is, as I mentioned before, that for so many young people, they're thoroughly socialized by an Afro-Americanized popular culture, but they, hardly, they find it difficult to interact with flesh and blood black people. They can turn on the television and see Martin and Oprah and Arsenio and a whole host of black folk who they revel in. But when it comes to flesh and blood black folk and black bodies, hard to make contact. Because your social life moves in a certain direction. Your residential patterns move in a certain direction. Religious life moves in a certain direction. I mean, part of the problem of trying to interact in a genuinely human way on college campuses. There's so many young people begin to bump up against people who are different for the first time in their lives. And you have no military experience, because of course the military was one of the means by which people from different classes and races had to come to terms with a common project. We don't have any national public service programs where you actually have to rub shoulders against somebody who you don't know and you have to learn something about their history. And so we have these highly balkanized, segmented, fragmented lives on a racial axis in a market culture, which makes it what? It makes it very difficult for there to be a substantive public life. And when you think of public life in America, we more and more associate it with race. Public education. I know in Jersey and New York, you tend to think of young black and brown bodies. Young black and brown brothers and sisters. Think of public provisions. Oh, we don't think of those subsidies to transnational corporations. We don't think of the free land and free technology, that welfare from above. We think of welfare below. And even more vicious, my God, one of the most pernicious metaphors that I've ever seen in this culture is that of welfare queen. This notion of associating the or one of the most hardest working groups in the history of this country, black women, with ripping off the American nation state. You think about that, it's how skewed 
that is. I mean, 1900, 68% of black women were raising white kids in white households, even as they were raising their own kids. 1946, 42% were still raising white kids in white households as they were raising their kids. If that's not the Protestant, if that's not the Protestant ethic, if that's not deferring gratification, that's not being frugal and thrifty, what is? That's hard work. And they become the symbol for ripping off the, the U.S. nation state, being lazy and thrifty? How skewed our perceptions. How skewed. I think of public transportation transporting disproportionate black and brown bodies. And most important for us as educators is the state of public conversation. The distrust and paranoia is so much of public conversation actually degenerates these days into name calling, finger pointing against the backdrop of flat sound bites. We come in with our identities. Your identity here, your identity here, and we bump it, we clash. I'm more oppressed than you are.